What's up, everybody? It is a good day today. It's a new day and another shot at the title. The Dallas Mavericks get themselves their best win of the young season last night, moving their record to 9 and 4 thanks to a 111 101 victory over the visiting Denver Nuggets. Now, there's a couple reasons this is such a good win for Dallas. First, it's their first quality win against a playoff caliber team. Denver, obviously, a very good team. Uh, kicked the crap out of Dallas in Denver just a couple of weeks back. And to get them back on your home floor is very nice. But anytime you're going up against the reigning MVP, you're going to have to contend with some stuff. And Dallas came out, and to their credit, they made some really good adjustments. And the renewed focus on defense with the new system they've installed clearly had a strong moment last night. Now, coming in, Dallas all-time in its home series against the Nuggets was 57-31. and 31, But you can never put a whole lot of stock in that sort of thing, especially if the matchup in question isn't that great. My goodness, is there a spacing issue with my setup? How absolutely dare you, OBS? Corrected. So the Mavericks get themselves a great win, and they have a lot of guys to thank for this. First and foremost, Kristaps Porzingis was a monster last night. Unicorn is back. I don't know for how long, that's always the question, but for right now, the Unicorn is back, and he showed out. In his first 20 minutes alone, he had 24 points. I mean, the dude was balling. Deep threes, pull-up jumpers looking silky smooth. Even, a, even the occasional post-up, taking advantage of that. When Dallas runs him as the lone big, they tend to have good results. And he is firing on all cylinders right now. So there are a couple things to consider here. First, Denver was on the second night of a back-to-back. -back. They just blew out Portland the night before. And... Yeah, the fact that they blew him out means that it wasn't like a grinded out game that really wears you down, but it is still the second night of a back-to-back. -back. And given it's a road trip oriented, you got to take that into consideration. So that's one thing. Their bench has been a little suspect this year, although it was pretty strong for at least the first half of this game. But those are things that worked in Dallas's favor here. We have to consider those. However, we can also consider... Dallas's own adjustments and their own guys stepping up. After the first quarter, Dallas led 35 to 32 thanks to a Jalen Brunson buzzer beating three on an inbound pass. Great move. Uh, not so much a move, I guess. Great shot. Just taking it on the spot up and with deep range, continuing his hot start to the season. And really for Dallas, it was about the second half adjustments. They did, I believe they did trail at the half, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a matter of the second half adjustments, particularly what they did defensively. Denver was held to 43 points in the second half and just 20 in the fourth quarter. More than that, with four minutes and change left in the fourth quarter, they had only scored 10 points. Dallas's defensive adjustments were phenomenal in this game, and their guys stepped up big. Now, Luka... Yes, he goes for 23, 8, and 11, but it's on 9 of 23 shooting, including 2 of 7 from 3, 3 of 5 at the line. So he didn't shoot the ball especially well, but at the very least, he wasn't asked to shoulder everything. You got 19 points out of Tim Hardaway Jr., including 13 in the fourth quarter. That's huge. You got 17 points out of Jalen Brunson on 8 of 12 shooting off the bench. I mentioned Hardaway. Let me shout out his... Uh, he was 2 of 6 on threes, but 8 of 14 from the field, so... Very good there. Uh, you got some good play as well from other guys like, let me see in my notes here. You got some big buckets, timely buckets, not big point turnout, but Bullock had a couple moments there when the Mavericks opened the fourth quarter with that 14-2 run, running a very unconventional small ball lineup that had Dorian Finney-Smith at the five. Uh, they used a barrage of three-pointers to close out the third quarter that took what was a fairly comfortable Denver lead and cut it down to four. So Dallas really came out on fire. Uh, the three started falling, and it completely flipped the complexion between the defense on one end and then knocking down threes suddenly on the other, Hardaway getting cooking in the fourth quarter. It just completely turned the game in Dallas's favor. Now, Jokic did have himself a big 
game as well. He went for 35 and 16. I actually have it incorrect there on the screen. Let me correct that. I had 36 points. I flipped the two numbers. Am I dyslexic? I don't know. But uh, 35 and 16 was Jokic's performance. So he had a dominant game as well. It was a great duel between him and KP, even though their styles are pretty different. But it was a very good effort from Denver. Now, they are still obviously without Murray, and they are a little bit limited in some respects, but they still got 17 out of Morris, 14 out of Gordon, 12 out of Austin Rivers. It's just their bench didn't give them a whole lot. Bull Bull in 11 minutes had seven points, and it was really weird watching him playing against KP. And you're kind of looking at him side by side, and you're like, dude, KP looks kind of beefy. What's up? KP's usually the scrawny guy out there that looks like he has no muscle on him. It's interesting to see that, but it's just a very good response from Dallas. Luka, I mentioned earlier, not his best day. He's still kind of wishy-washy to start the year, but it's a new offensive system, and they're trying to change things up a little bit. The offense does seem like it's kind of figuring itself out a little bit. A big part of that is getting KP going. And internally, the team has said that they've never really been concerned that they would eventually figure out the offense, even though I know we've talked about it. Mavs Twitter has talked about it. It's been a very heavily debated discussion, but internally, they are not concerned. They were never concerned that the team was going to sort it out offensively. And yeah, maybe it is turning out to be that way, because even though Luka is averaging just 25, 8, and 7, by the way, that's phenomenal for anyone not named Luka, it, it's still not... You're not even getting your best Luka yet, and you're starting to rack up some wins. Dallas has won five out of six. Obviously, the, the loss to Chicago was the one blemish there, and they're really turning things around. I like the fact that Brunson has turned into a real closer for them off the bench. Uh, he had some big buckets late in this game as well, and uh, obviously, I'd be remiss if in this game I didn't mention that Luka had a badly sprained ankle in the final minute there's still some question about his status there. He didn't talk to the media after the game, and practice today was canceled. So until the team travels later today, this afternoon, in fact, to Phoenix for their next game, they got a couple against the Suns. Until they travel there, we're probably not going to hear anything about Luka's ankle with, in terms of an update. So that's something to keep an eye on. KP said after the game, he asked Luka about it, and Luka kind of played it off like he usually does when he's banged up, just says, oh, I'm good, I'm good. And KP kind of intimated, like... You know, I, I don't know. Guys say that, but are they usually, are they always as good as they say they are? Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes you get away from it. The adrenaline wears off a little bit and it gets a little tighter, a little more sore. That's something to keep an eye on. But we'll see. If Luca has to miss any time, we might find out real quick how good this team is in his absence. And in the past, that has been not very good at all. So that's, that's that uh, update there. But let's talk a little bit about KP and his recent breakout here. We, we talked about his game against the Spurs. That was a great game for him. His last three games, he's averaging 27.7 points per game, 10 boards on 55% field goals, 50% from three, and 90% at the line. Again, Dallas has won five out of six. They are currently third in the West. They are 13-5 and five all time when KP goes for 25-plus points and 10-plus rebounds. You'd like to say that they'd have more than 18 such games in year three at this point. But even still, if you get KP going, the team typically handles its business. And uh, since returning from his injury, we talked about how many games he missed early in the year. He's averaging 23.2 points per game and nine boards. It's not bad. Not bad at all. And what I like, as I mentioned earlier, is that KP is doing it from everywhere right now. He's hitting pull-up jumpers. He's hitting the logo threes, deep spot-up threes, even a little bit of posting up here and there. It's not a strong suit of his, but it's working better. And I think they're doing a better job of not having two bigs on the floor, not having him and Powell in such close proximity clogging up the paint when one guy's in the low post and the other is like rolling in a pick and roll and there's just nowhere to go. They're doing a better job keeping him out in space and letting him cook. And as a result, you get 29 points in 33 minutes, 11 of 20 from the field, 5 of 8 from 3, a block, and 2 steals. Yeah, I will take that Kristaps Porzingis every day of the week, twice on Sunday. I like it. I like it. We'll see if he can hold up doing this. Obviously, KP playing at the 5 is better than him playing at the 4. There, We've seen adjustments. 
The minutes the past two or three games for Powell have scaled back. The minutes for Dorian Finney-Smith, even though he's started to hit threes better, have scaled back. And I think the reason for that isn't that it's... It's not that, like, oh, you're struggling, so we're going to reduce your minutes. I think they're just understanding that those guys need to operate in in bursts. They need to be guys that are used in stretches at a given moment as opposed to just, hey, here's 20-plus minutes. Here's, in Dorian Finney-Smith's case, 30 minutes. They need to adjust that. How many minutes did Dorian have? So he still ended up with 24 minutes in this game. Powell had 18. I think that's Powell's third straight game now with under 20 minutes. Um, and Dorian's scaled back. Like I said, usually he'd be a guy with 35 minutes plus in years past and even the start of this season. So I think they are making adjustments, trying to work around the, the rotation a little bit and kind of understanding what they need to do as far as spacing the floor and what they need to do as far as getting some of these other guys cooking. Uh, I really like, he played 16 minutes last night. His numbers weren't big. Nilakina in 16 minutes had three points, two rebounds, an assist. Only one of four from the field, one of three from three. It was a, a nice corner three. He's become a fan favorite. And it's really interesting to see, like, a, a, a moment in, I think it was the start of the fourth quarter, you had a, a little scuffle between the two teams where you have Dorian Finney-Smith grab a rebound, a defensive rebound, and I think it was Jermichael Green throws Nilakina to the ground. And Dodo basically gets immediately, like, pushes him away. And then they get into a, a little bit of a standoff. The teammates kind of pull him apart. Not like it was anything too animated. I know Jermichael Green got a little bit animated. Whether he was just frustrated or trying to spark his team, I don't know. But that was a, a turning point, I thought, for the Mavericks. Because they had already played well in the third quarter defensively. But it seemed like that kind of gave them a renewed attitude of like, all right, screw you. You're not getting anything then. And they pretty much starved Denver for the most part. Like I said, they got down to like four and a half minutes left in the game. And in that fourth quarter, they had just 10 points up until that point. You're not going to win a lot of games on the road when you're performing that badly in the fourth quarter. So Dallas gets itself a quality, quality win here. I'm still a little frustrated <laughs> With uh, Sterling Brown, there's just nothing there that I'm seeing right now. He got eight minutes, 0 of 1 from the field. He did have an assist. Uh, he's just kind of a body that's out there. Willie Cauley-Stein played just three minutes. Some of these guys not getting much burn. If you're going to play Willie Cauley-Stein three minutes, I'd rather see those minutes go to Moses Brown. I know you played Boban in the game, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to play Boban and Moses Brown uh, in the game. Obviously, you wouldn't do it together but play them in the game. It's almost like you're picking a one versus the other kind of thing. I love Boban. I'd rather see those minutes go to Moses Brown personally because Boban is what he is. And yes, he's had some success uh, in the past against Denver. Obviously, the last game before the uh, NBA season suspended a couple of years ago, and then they ended up restarting months later in the bubble. The last game of the NBA season before the suspension was Dallas hosting Denver and Boban helped Dallas. He had a monster game, helped Dallas beat Jokic and Denver in that night. So I get it a little bit. You know, the, the physical strength and presence and upper body strength isn't a huge advantage for uh, Moses Brown that we've talked about. So maybe that was part of the thinking there. Just uh, a physical body to throw at Jokic and to try and offset him a little bit there, even though, again, he played three minutes. So let's not act like that was a big part of the game plan. I'd like to see Moses Brown in his, uh, what's what's the phrase they use? Gazelle-like running motion as he goes down the floor for a dunk. I'd like to see that in transition in that case more than I'd like to see Boban, frankly. But, yeah, it's a quality win. Is there? Let me see. Let me go through the actual stats here. Dallas shot 50% from the field, 39% from three. Denver just 28% from three on 32 attempts. Dallas took 36 attempts, so Dallas is three-point attempt number has gone down like they said they were going to do and it is starting to pay more dividends here and then that's a encouraging i'd like to see them get to the free throw line a lot more they only took 10 free throws they were seven of 10 from the field luca had a couple of those misses who had the other free throw miss that was dwight powell went one of two at the line dallas really good protecting the ball eight turnovers compared to 11 for denver 30 assists they are moving the ball better. That was something Jake Kemp talked about after the Spurs game was Dallas was 
like bottom five in the league in terms of passes per game. The ball just stuck, whether it was in Luka's hands or whoever. They didn't move the ball well enough. And in that particular instance, the number of passes they had in that game, if they averaged that, it would be good for top five in the NBA. So substantial change there. But they keep moving the ball well here. 30 assists on the game. That's a strong number. I like that a lot. And uh, they do lose the rebound battle, 46 to 44, but they, they get a push on the offensive glass at 10 apiece. So that's good. Uh, KP had a block. Someone else got a block as well. They only had two blocks on the day. Seven steals, though. Part of that comes from KP had two. Credit to him. Part of that comes from uh, Nilakina's presence as well. He had a steal. So, yeah, very good work there for the Mavericks. And Luca had the other two. Very good work there for the Mavericks. It's their best win of the young season. They are working with serious momentum at this point. And they're starting to figure things out. You had, I think it was Zach Lowe on ESPN, I believe it was, the other day, um, basically saying the Mavericks, to him, are a fascinating kind of wild card out there because they kind of sort of are figuring things out a little bit. Now, it's so obscenely early to do this, and it feels like one of those just shot caller attempts. But he basically is saying... Oh, they're a fascinating team because, like, if they're figuring it out, and it seems like they might be, they're a dark horse for the finals. And I'm always just like, dude, can we just get out of the first round? Can we just get out of the first round right now? Like, obviously, I, I, I want and expect to go further than the first round, but it's been 10 years. We haven't won a playoff series since the finals. We need minimum second round appearance. Let's just do that. If we do that, then we can start talking about, all right, now let's turn our attention to the bigger goals. It's kind of like how for the Cowboys, everyone talks Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl. And I'm just like, dude, it's been a quarter century since we've been to the NFC Championship game. Can we do that first? Can we check off one item and then move on to the next? Like, let's not just jump to the end and uh, not enjoy the ride. Anyway, good win for the Mavericks. We'll see what the update is on Luka. They play tomorrow night at Phoenix, and then again Friday night at Phoenix. Phoenix is 10-3 and three on the year, so they are ahead of Dallas in the Western Conference. Then they got back-to-back -back with the Clippers on the road as well. Next four games are going to tell you a lot about this team because the Clippers are 8-5, and five, but they were on a seven-game win streak before losing, I think, just their last game. So a lot to consider there. You're going up against a hot couple of teams in the Western Conference, two teams that obviously were in the Western Finals last year. That's going to be a real quick way to find out how good you actually are. It's not playing the Warriors, thankfully. They're 11-2 and atop the Western Conference, but it's uh, two of the most quality teams you could face. Hey, after facing one, another one of the most quality teams you could face and getting a win. That's going to do it for my time, though. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.